Okay, today's review topic is genetics. So just keep in mind that genetics and DNA and evolution are kind of all tied together and you can't really delineate between them because they each affect each other. Um, but for today on genetics, when we're gonna go over the basic terms and the basic skills that you should be able to do, okay? So on this first screen here, what I have numbered one through six, those are probably the most important terms that you need to know. Okay, so remember when Mendel was doing his study of the pea plants um, back in the 1800s, he called plants like true breeding or whatever. So what he figured out is that traits generally have two characteristics, either they are dominant or they are recessive. Okay, so a dominant trait, and please take these terms lightly, okay, Dominant trait means it's more powerful, but that doesn't mean what it sounds like. It just means basically if you get that gene, it's showing up. Okay, so you can have one, you can get the allele from one parent or you can get the allele from both parents, but that trait is going to show up. Brown hair is a good example of that. Brown eyes is another example of that. Okay, recessive means it is the weaker gene, but not weak as in how we think of weak. But the only way a recessive gene can show up is if you get two of them. Okay, so for example, any person you know that has blonde hair, they had to receive the blonde headed gene from both parents in order to show up recessive for blonde hair. So if they got a brown headed gene and a blonde headed gene from both parents, they would automatically be brown headed. So the dominant gene would show up. All right. So in pea plants, the dominant traits were tall, having a yellow pea, um, having flowers on the end, all kinds of things. OK, so that's what he started his um, genetic studies with. So in other words, dominant is represented with a capital letter and recessive is represented with a lowercase letter. All right. Two other important terms, homozygous and heterozygous. You guys have seen the prefixes homo and hetero so much, you should know what they mean by now. Homozygous means they are the same. Heterozygous means they are different. Now, what I mean by homozygous is, you know, I know you see there on the screen, it's big A, big A, or little A, little A, and you're like, Miss Wayne, they're both A's. You're right, but remember, the A means dominant and the little A means recessive. So although it is the same letter, it is a totally different representation. Okay, so you could be homozygous for a trait and have big A, big A, or little a, little a, or any other letter you choose. You could be heterozygous for a trait, which is big A, little a. That means you received one dominant gene and one recessive gene, okay? Now, a lot of traits in the human body are this or that. So for an example, you can either roll your tongue or you can't. There's nothing in between. All right, but a lot of our traits do something that we call blending, which is incomplete dominance. So, for example, you know, just saying that someone has brown hair or blonde hair, it isn't that simple. We have all these colors in between. Or someone who has straight hair, which is dominant, curly hair, which is recessive, but a lot of times that blends and you get somebody who has wavy hair. Okay, all right, and then the last two, genotype and phenotype. The genotype just refers to the letters that we've been discussing. Big A, little a, little t, little t, big Z, little z, etc. And then the phenotype is the physical trait that is expressed from that. So blonde hair, blue eyes, freckles, um, thorns on a rose bush, the skunk's white stripe, whatever. So if you can remember the pH, and the pH, phenotype, physical trait, physical characteristic, okay? All right, and the other thing on this screen is meiosis, and I kind of randomly threw it in here because this is where it fits the best. Remember that meiosis is the process of making sex cells. We've previously gone over mitosis, which is how we make every other cell in your body, but sex cells are so special that they have to go through their own division and it is called meiosis. Some people say meiosis, doesn't matter. This is the making of gametes or sex cells. And the main thing you have to know is be able to compare them. So with meiosis, you end up with four cells at the end. And the reason this is, is because it divides two times. 
instead of going through cytokinesis once, like in mitosis, it goes through it twice. And the reason being is your sex cells have to have half the number of chromosomes in them, right? So that way, you know, obviously when half and half unite, it makes a whole. So if we didn't divide our chromosomes in half each time, you wouldn't have the correct number of chromosomes for your new organism, okay? And the other thing that's extremely important with meiosis is you need to remember that all of the sex cells are genetically unique. So every egg in a female's body and every sperm in a male's body, even though there are millions and millions of them, are genetically unique. They are a recombination of the parents' genes and their parents and their parents and so on, okay? So that's meiosis in a nutshell. All right, so let's kind of look at some examples here. Um, you will have to perform a Punnett square. So remember, you put the female's genes here, the male's genes here, it doesn't really matter, okay? One allele over each box, and then you put them together in the boxes. So as an example, if this were tall and this were short, the top two are heterozygous for tall, and the bottom two are short. So remember that each square is a 25% chance of getting that trait. And all this represents is the chances of an organism having that trait. This does not mean that uh, this pea plant is going to have exactly four baby pea plants and exactly two will be tall and exactly two will be short. It's just a probability. So every time the sperm and egg unite from these particular pea plants, there's a 50% chance they'll be tall and a 50% chance they will be short. Okay, remember it's just probability. All right, also in genetics are the four blood types. Um, I need you to remember that O is the recessive one. Blood typing is, is an example of co-dominance, okay? Just like you have co-captains on a baseball team, football team, whatever, they're equally as powerful. So um, A is dominant, B is dominant, but if they both show up, they're both dominant, which is where our co-dominance comes from, and that's a new blood type called AB, and then O is recessive to everything else. Remember that O is the universal donor, so if there are ambulances out there, more than likely they carry type O blood on the ambulance because that's what you can give to anyone, okay? AB is special also because it is called the universal recipient. So if you have AB blood, you can receive A, B, A, B, and O and be in the clear. Okay, so remember, just like with other traits, you can have a homozygous and a heterozygous, but they're all capital letters this time. And instead of writing heterozygous as like big A, little A, it would be big A, O. Okay, O is the recessive one. All right, now there is also a positive negative component to blood, but that won't be on your EOC. Okay, so there are four human blood types, and um, a lot of times they'll ask you to figure out who could or could not be the parent in, in a particular Punnett square for these, okay? All right, two other things that you have to be able to do is look at a pedigree. Um, this is showing like family relationships here. Um, the squares are guys and the circles are girls. If there is a line coming down from in between them, it either means they were married and had these children, or of course nowadays just had these children. So each successive group is a generation. So this one is showing three generations, and the ones that are colored in have whatever trait this may be. A lot of times we use pedigrees for diseases, but it could be just for a particular trait. And just to give you a hint, See how there's only two in this entire chart? So this is probably showing a recessive disorder, okay? If there were some in every generation, it's probably dominant. And if you remember, we did some sex-linked traits. Those are the ones that affect guys more than girls. So if you see one where there's a lot of squares colored in, it's probably showing a sex-linked trait. All right, then the last thing on this screen is a karyotype. This is when we get an organism's chromosomes and we um, take pictures of them and put them in order, and this is all computer gener generated now. So just remember that if an individual is um, XX, that it's a female, okay? And if it is XY, it is a male, 
Okay, so in this particular karyotype here, there's one X and there's one Y. So this is a male, all right? And then what you can do with karyotypes, if you, you can see if there are extra chromosomes or missing chromosomes or whatever. So this one, even though it's got some bent ones and all that, that doesn't mean anything. Um, this I would consider a normal male, okay? All right, so guys, that's about it for um, genetics, and I'm sure I'm missing something, so look back over through Google Classroom if there's something else you need to review. Um, most importantly, I would know how to do a Punnett square. Please remember that each box is 25%. Um, and these are some practice questions that you can kind of go through and, and give that a try. And if you need me to give you the answers to these, I'll be glad to do so. Okay, so let me know if you have any questions. Thank you.